Hello and let's talk about the ever-rising number of COVID-19 cases in the country. The numbers for yesterday announced today morning are staggering. India recorded 95,735 cases yesterday, the single highest number in one day, not only for our country but for the entire world. This is not really the kind of record to be proud about and one question that has emerged time and again is why did our graph never get flat? Most countries which reported a high number of cases after a while saw the numbers come down. Now some of these countries saw second wave of infections with fresh cases being reported in large numbers. A good example is the United States. However, there has not been any drastic decline in cases in India. So why is India's situation different? Newsclicks Prabhu Purkayastha talks to immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath on this issue. Yes, so um, clearly um, the situation in the two most populous countries of the world could not be more divergent where in one case, the pandemic, if you like, began very early um, at the end of the last calendar year, not even in 2020. Um, and yet their total numbers in China are actually less than our, at least some of our recent daily numbers. Whereas the dramatically different trajectory that the pandemic took with us was that it started very much more slowly. One might almost say it started much later. It gained strong, enduring footholds in communities in India much, much later. And I suspect that part of the reason for that Please let us all keep in mind that much of this is guesswork of, uh, of trying to make sense of a chaotic situation. But that said, our um, draconian nationwide lockdown with a four hour notice um, implemented as a law and order policing problem uh, quite, quite clearly from day one, will have had the effect, as we have been saying since then, of delaying establishment and foothold for the, for the infection. Simply because people in the early weeks stayed at home with the resultant uh, economic breakdown, with the resultant non-COVID-19 public health breakdown, not simply treating illness, but also in providing support to pregnant women for children's immunizations in all of this. Because people stayed at home, we simply delayed the takeoff. But the takeoff was always going to happen because you're never going to stop the last possibility of infection. So the thing that we needed to have done, which we do not clearly seem to have done with, with any efficiency, is put in place a genuine, reliable, community participating, testing to scale, contact tracing to scale, and isolation in practicable, humane, well-supported fashion. We've never done this. Our response still continues to be a policing response. One of the major prominent pieces of COVID-19 pandemic related news in India over the past few days, for example, is that the police are collecting now X amounts of funds as fines from people who are not wearing masks. And the interesting thing there is we're not discussing the failure of public outreach of information and true community participation in people not wearing masks. Instead, we are simply addressing how much money we've collected for, for non-wearing of masks. And this is emblematic of what we've been saying all these months, that a public health problem is being treated as a law and order problem. When, when that has been the consistent approach, it's no surprise that what we are going to have is simply, as I said, a delay in the establishment of, of the infection in the community because of the draconian lockdown, followed by 
an expansion of the pandemic in the of as the as the lockdown weakens a continued rise of numbers in any case the lockdown had to break down you need to give people food which you were not giving they had so, their poor migration so we have done this in the past and since you bring it up I, let's uh, underline it again the timetable for the unlockdown has been driven by in part by the socio economic inevitabilities that you point out that there's only so long that people can sustain it in socio economic terms and by a political trajectory of management of public relations if you will rather than responding to actual ground level pandemic situation it's also interesting that even now it's a ministry of home that releases all the guidelines ministry of health has disappeared from view we don't even have the health minister come in on the television screens and when the prime minister does come he is seen with peacocks feeding them but you know or on red fort but we don't really hear him talking about the mahabharata war against covid 19 we thought would be over in 3 weeks but leaving that out this is a political criticism of the public relations leaving it out what we don't see is any evaluation of what has happened and what we need to do now except talking about in a very opaque fashion lockdown and unlockdown phases and saying that now the central government is going to look after districts directly minus the state governments even bypassing the state government again a completely uh, stop down centralized law and order approach to the problem of course the emergency act that we have and we are under a state of emergency because of the disaster management act which is in operation at the moment coming to a more specific issue since you are in pune and pune has emerged as the uh, probably the large fastest growing numbers of any urban area at the moment what explains this in pune so um, as as i have said uh, repeatedly all these months there aren't necessarily rational explanations for every event in the chaotic landscape of of uh, 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 of, an, of an epidemic that said let's keep what i think of as the class dimension of the epidemic in mind the epidemic was initiated by the extent of international travel in volume terms meaning large volume of international travel exchange this is not to blame one person bringing a disease or anything of the sort this is simply to point out that infection as a statistical phenomenon would spread from country to country from one original uh, uh, source point with likelihoods that would correlate with the volume of air travel and the volume of air travel is driven even today by and large by business considerations so in a certain sense it is the socio economic class category of business travelers who are in a statistical sense the transmitters across international boundaries but once you have the virus beginning to spread locally the local spread depends on on a completely different set of socio economic conditions it depends on crowding and not just crowding as in the marketplace but crowding over a full 24 hour period with housing very close to each other with crowding within houses with um, shared uh, toilet facilities with extraordinarily narrow lanes and so on and so forth now if you think about it in those terms then the largest labor concentration urban labor concentration which lives in india in the most crowded apartment colony conditions or tenement colony conditions um, 
what in uh, the Mumbai Pune sector would be called Zhopad Patti, which in Delhi would be called the Chugi Jhopri uh, residential conditions, or uh, one step above, we built crowded flats, but with shared toilet facilities that are called uh, the chawls in the Mumbai Pune sector, uh, which are essentially tenement housing. Mum the Mumbai Pune urban conglomerate is the largest urban apartment and tenement colony uh, community in the country connected to the largest international transit point okay. of travel, which is Mumbai. The extent of crowding is much more in quantitative terms in a variety of parameters than in, than in Delhi. So yes, for me, it's not surprising that it's over this sector that steady, relentless growth. Please keep in mind that the relentless growth is also a, a something of an artifact of our political definitions. The virus is still popping up in different small neighborhoods and uh, dying down and popping up and dying down. But it's all happening within this, what I'm calling, in extremely high density working class communities. In our next segment, we bring you a chunk of a conversation between writer Vijay Prashad and Marxist intellectual Ajaz Ahmed. They're talking about the recent New York Times report on comments made or comments about India made by former US President Richard Nixon during the time of the Bangladesh Liberation War. These hateful, racist and misogynist comments have been rightly condemned, but Professor Ajaz Ahmed talks about how racism and supremacism have been an integral part of UN for US foreign policy for ages. Coming back again uh, to the question of independence of India's foreign policy in this period, or you know, however one understands it, um, there were atrocities committed in East Pakistan. Uh, the Indian Army did end up intervening. Um, I mean, there is something interesting because in Gary Bass's book, The Blood Telegram, um, he does talk a lot about the indifference of US diplomacy to this level of suffering. And I think that bears some comment that it's not just Kissinger and Nixon being nasty about Indian women in general or Indira Gandhi. In particular. Yeah, that, that, that message me and and we'll get it to you. Yeah. There's something right. to order there, yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. You see, um, first of all, that indifference, their indifference to the people they themselves kill, and, you know, Iraq, Syria, Libya, you, you begin to understand that this is an imperial mentality which is completely indifferent to human suffering. You know, th this, th this reflects very, very deeply. In the United States, again, uh, the history of atrocities on their own people and this misogyny and you know they're unattractive etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, they produce too many children etc um, th this is their own history from the time of slavery on this this is this is part of what in these days is called white supremacy you know indifferent to the lives of not of people of um, these countries, deep misogyny, deep racism, and their own interest. Their own interest overrides everything. We, I need to just make this visit. Now, you could pay, they could pay attention to what was actually going on in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and say, okay, we'll go to, to Beijing some other day. It, it isn't as if the, the, the Chinese would uh, object to some postponement of it. You know, uh, so an overriding preoccupation with their own 
geopolitics and this mass suffering of people. Mass suffering imposed by your ally and in fact with your weapons. Complete indifference to that. And because India has has had this independent policy of whatever you want. And, and it really was independent at the, at the time of uh, Indira Gandhi and so on. Um, therefore, you dislike them. And therefore, this immense burden of having you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million or whatever the number of the, the refugees and so on, none of it matters to you. You, you know, there aren't even words of sympathy for India having to play this role. And interestingly, there's no discussion of the fact that uh, India effectively will break up the country of their ally. They're not even interested in that. And so sheer indifference, you're just background material for their ambitions. One of the, the outside contexts of this is that 1971 was a particularly difficult year for the Vietnamese liberation movement. Um, it's also a year where a number of scandals came to court, including William Kelly of the My Lai. You know, while they're talking in the White House, these scandals are uh, swirling about. Uh, there was Operation Texas Star taking place as they're talking. I mean, the sheer violence against the Vietnamese people, the use Ooh. Ooh. Of, uh, of, you know, chemical weapons and so on. Uh, Absolutely. The of suffering is perhaps and, exactly... You know, I mean, eventually, eventually the final bombings of Hanoi, the TNT was greater than the two atomic bombs um, uh, dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But... So that is another way of looking at it, that these are people who are indifferent to their own victims. Whatever it takes, it doesn't matter if you kill every Vietnamese, they, which they tried very hard. So, you know, there is certain, you learn something about the imperial mindset. It is vulgar, it is misogynistic, it is racist, and it is indifferent to human suffering. And these are the people who talk about democracy, human rights, this, that, and the other. It's an extraordinary you know, disjunction. That's all we have time today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.